Misconceptions of weight. All freely floating bodies which are in balance with their environment have no weight whatsoever. The moment any potential is taken out of an environment of equal potential, electric strains and tensions are set up in the unbalanced mass, thus removed which measure the resistance to that removal. A stone, for example, is very much out of balance with an equal volume of air. The stone will fall to seek a like potential, not because it has weight as a property of itself, but because of the strains of electric polarity which divide the universal balance into equal and opposite unbalanced pairs, and insist upon keeping the universe in balance. Science believes that a man who weighs 150 pounds while surrounded by air still weighs 150 pounds when surrounded by the entirety different pressures of water in which he floats. That is not a true concept. When a man is surrounded by air, he is out of balance with polarity which divides pressures equally. Electric tensions then act as elastic bands which are sufficiently stretched to register a strain of 150 pounds pull against the zero of his balance. When he is surrounded by water, however, the pressures of displacement and replacement are equalized. Each is in balance with the other and weight disappears. If weight were a fixed attribute of matter, it would be unchangeable. It varies, however, as the potentials of masses out of balance vary. A man weighs less as he ascends a mountain and more in a deep pit. As water falls, it compresses and gains in potential. As it rises, it divides into vapors and loses potential. It, therefore, weighs less. When its potential is equal in volume to the volume of potential displaced, it floats as a cloud. It then has no weight. And so it is with the stars, suns, planets, and moons. They are all freely floating bodies and have no weight in respect to any other body in the universe. Each solid centers an opposing polarized volume of space in a wave field in which each polarized condition is of equal potential but of unequal volume. Every balanced wave field is insulated from each other wave field by reversals of curvature which are separately considered in later pages. The following definitions of weight will help to clarify the present misconception regarding it. 1. Weight is the measure of unbalance between the two electric forces which polarize the universal equilibrium. 2. Weight is the sum of the difference between the two pressures which act on every mass. 3. Weight is the sum of the difference in electric potential between any mass and the volume it occupies. 4. Weight is the measure of the force which a body exerts in seeking its true potential. 5. Weight is the sum of the difference between the inward thrust of gravitation and the outward thrust of radiation. Regarding initial impulse, the movement of planets around their suns and of moons around their planets has always been an unexplained mystery. In ancient days, even up to the 16th century, it was commonly believed that angels pushed the planets around in their orbits. It is today quite commonly believed that at the time of the creation of the universe, an initial impulse was given to each planet and moon, which was just sufficient to keep each one forever moving around its primary. The slightest understanding of the nature of the electric current and its mechanical process of dividing one condition of eternal balance into two opposed conditions of unbalance would dispute such a belief. There are countless billions of suns, earths, moons, and the heavens. It cannot just happen that each of these has just the right initial velocity to keep in its orbit as a result of the primal cataclysm which is credited with the birth of the universe. That would be too great a cosmic coincidence for acceptance by any reasoning person. Also, such a theory would not bear the weight of so great a disturbing factor 
of this belief as the fact that no speed of any solar body is constant, as it would have to be to give substance to such a claim. Every solar body is forever and constantly varying its speed around its primary. It varies it in each revolution by going faster for one half and slower for the other half. It also varies it over its millions of years of motion by gradually slowing its speed of revolution and increasing its speed of rotation as it spirals away from its primary. During these periods, not one of the billions of solar bodies ever goes fast enough to fly off at a tangent from its primary, nor slow enough to fall into it, which in any case could not happen regardless of speed. In addition to the foregoing is the fact that there never has been a primal cataclysm which created the universal universe. Electricity does not work that way, and there is no other working force in the universe than the dual electric force. Electricity expresses its dividing powers equally and simultaneously. Electricity then grows her effects to maturity and takes them apart to repeat them sequentially. Also, there have been billions of generations of suns, just as there have been millions of generations of men. If the initial impulse theory has any merit, that merit would not apply to descendants ten times ten billion generations removed. Our moon is not one minute old in cosmic time, it could therefore have no initial impulse. This is a radial universe and every center of gravity in every solar body is the apex of a koanic section. Every satellite of every such body is a radial projection from the equator of its primary. It first appears as a ring thrown off centrifugally from its parent equator. The ring becomes a sphere which centers its own wave field within its ancestor wave field then continues its outward spiral journey for millions of years of ever-slowing speed and ever-changing potential to keep in balance with the ever-changing potential of its wave field. Our solar system is a good example. Consider Mercury as the latest extension of our Sun. It is very hot and very compressed. Planet, planet it is a very compressed planet which speeds around its primary in less than three months. When Mercury spirals out to where our Earth is, it will take four times as long to make one revolution and it will be about four times as large in volume, for it must gradually expand to keep in balance with the ever-changing equal potential layer of pressure gradient which reaches out from the Sun into space. When Mercury attains the position of Jupiter, it will be many times larger, and its period of revolution will be many years. Also, its period of rotation will speed up as its period of revolution slows down, in order that centripetal and centrifugal effects of polarization will keep their balance with each other. Likewise, the inner moon of Mars circles its primary every 7 hours, while the outer moon takes 30 hours. All orbits are elliptical for they are in angular colonic sections. Likewise, all other centripetal or centrifugal spirals, because their paths are either in the direction of the apex or the base of a cone. Contraction in the centripetal direction accounts for increase of speed as planets approach their perphelia and expansion in the direction of a colonic base accounts for the decrease in speed of revolution of outer planets and also for decrease in speed as planets approach their apophilia. In view of all such very orderly periodicies and processes in the formation of material systems, it seems incredible that a formula such as Newton's hypotheses ever should be thought of as proof that matter attracts matter or that initial impulse accounted for the speed of planetary revolution. The two ways of life and death. Nature projects or extends its wave lever for one way of its or one half of its cycle to manifest the life and growth principle. 
That is the process of polarization. Polarization vitalizes bodies by dividing their zero condition of rest and extending the divided pairs away from their zero equator as far as they can go. Polarization thrusts inwardly in centripetal spirals. It contracts to create gravity. Nature then withdraws its wave lever into its zero source to manifest the death and decay principle during the other half of every cycle. That is the process of depolarization. Depolarization devitalizes bodies by voiding the desire of the divided conditions to oppose each other. It relaxes the strains and the tensions of electric opposition. Depolarization thrusts outwardly in centrifugal spirals. It expands to radiate every generated body back into the zero of its source in order that death may reverse its manifestation and reappear as life. Matter appears when polarization divides an equilibrium, zeros into two zeros of opposite polarity. Matter then disappears when the divided and the opposed poles unite to rest in the internal one zero of the still light from which all things appear into which they disappear for the purpose of reappearing in eternal sequences. What are life and death? That which man calls life in bodies is accelerative motion only, the centripetal motion of interchanging, interchanging wave vibrations between two poles which have been extended from the one of their source. It is the accelerative motion of centripetal force which generates and contracts. Science has long been searching for the life principle in some germ of matter. It may as well cast nets into the sea to search for oxygen. That which is called death is just the opposite half of the whole life cycle. It is the decelerative motion of centrifugal force which degenerates, decays, and expands. Even though all bodies are both living and dying in each breath sequence of their whole cycle, the generative force of polarization is stronger in the first half of the cycle. Conversely, all dying bodies are living while they die. But the degenerative force of depolarization, which devitalizes, is the stronger in the second half. Life is eternal. There is no death. Life is but simulated in the matter of polarization depolarization sequences as all idea of mind is but simulated in thought waves of moving matter. We now return to Newton's one-way laws and one-way mathematics. Newton's one-way laws and the hypotheses account for falling bodies which are within the same wave field and as a, se or as a consequence have weight in respect to their common centers of gravities. Falling bodies are polarizing bodies they gain weight as they fall. Newton's law do not account, however, for rising bodies which have reversed their polarities and lose weight as they rise. Neither do they account for floating bodies such as suns, planets, or moons, which center their own wave fields and as a consequence have no weight in respect to any other body in the universe. Apples do expand into gases, however, and rise, and liquids do expand into vapors and rise. Cycles do not end in gravity. That is but the halfway point where they simultaneously reverse their every attribute. They reverse their direction, their potential, the polarities, their densities, their spectrum colors, and their weight. One attribute cannot be reversed with reverse, without reversing all. The polarizing direction of gravity multiplies the power of all expressions of force Y. De while depolarizing directions of the radiation divides them all in the equal but opposite ratios. Mm -hmm. the, attribute, the attribute of attraction which Newton gives to falling bodies exploding inward towards gravity should also apply to rising bodies exploding outward towards expanded space. To apply that truth, we would have to say, Every particle of matter in the universe repels every other particle with a force which varies inversely as the product of the masses and directly as the square of the distance. 
Can it be true, therefore, that every particle of matter attracts every other particle of matter in the universe and also repels every other particle? How can either or both be true when each denies the truth of the other? Matter neither attracts nor repels matter. Matter moves in two opposite directions for the sole purpose of simulating idea and formed bodies by dynamic action-reaction sequences, and then seeks rest in the light of idea to reawaken desire for again simulating idea. All motion is unbalanced. All motion is forever seeking rest from its unbalanced condition by seeking voidance of its motion.